Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. I think today we don't have that many people, only like eight of us. But uh, anyway, we just go through the session and go through the questions that um, on the slide here, I think we have a list of questions. I think some of them I don't have answer. I, I will just um, look around and see who want to give the response. Uh. Yeah, I see Daniel has joined the session. Okay, uh, just for, for those who are new to this session, uh, this session is recorded. I'll put uh, on the video, I will upload to my uh, YouTube channel. But the main reason is just to go through the uh, session and uh, the presentation and also the the questions. Uh. So I'll start first. Uh, today's topic is Facebook, but of course we can touch on other topics later. Um, I think in the chat group I also shared, right? Um, I before before this earnings season, I have thirty two shares of Facebook. Uh, the reason that I own Facebook is because I, I know they are very strong uh, in terms of their earnings, in terms of their products. I mean the advertising money just plowing in, right? So I bought that uh, for the reasons of their earnings and not so much on the metaverse. Uh, I think I accumulated their shares since like one or two years back. Um, keep on buying uh, a little bit, a little bit, uh, not not like in one go. And since the metaverse announcement, I actually uh, like slowed down my purchase and I think I, I have stopped investing. Uh. I just want to see what they have been doing on the metaverse and see whether it is promising or not. Because uh, based on my very limited understanding on the metaverse, right, they are actually not like in the ads business. Because in the ad business, is basically duopoly, right? It's between... Uh, Meta and also Google, uh, online ads. Uh. But when it comes to Metaverse, right, they are probably not the first one, right? So there are other companies, for example, like TikTok, Snapchat. These are the companies that actually also have some promising tech uh, when, when it comes to like Metaverse stuff and also others, right? For example, like gaming companies. So that's why I'm not very convinced on the uh, on the development on the metaverse. I just uh, adopted a wait and see approach. Uh. But now since the earning release come up, right, I'm a bit skeptical because I see that their core uh, strength, right, which is on the online ads, right, uh, is really hit by the iOS changes and also some developments uh, that is quite worrying for me. So I think I'll just uh, just just talk about this uh, DAU uh, because because I think. Wait, let me let me show the where is it uh, the DAU. Hmm? These are all the financial statement. So I think this chart is the one that I I I'm mostly concerned about. Because we all know that how they generate revenues is really based on eyeballs, right? So first, you need to have the people slot in onto the platforms, and then you monetize them, right? But the monetizations, uh, there's this um, ARPU that you have to look at to de determine how much uh, revenue that they will generate. But just look at this trend, right? You see in the past, right, whether it is like all sorts of scandal in the past, right, their DAU keep increasing one, meaning that uh, as much as people hate uh, Facebook, right, People still uh, log in back to the uh, to the apps and stay on the platform, but I think here this uh, most recent quarter we see that the DAU has dropped just slightly, not not a lot. But what I'm mostly worried about is that if this drop right is not like something like a normal volatility or a noise right, but this one let's say next quarter it drop another let's say. Um, just a little bit drop compared to current quarter, right? Then I think uh, the investor will have the perception that this entire pla uh, Facebook platform right, will be going downhill, you know? So they will tend to extrapolate all this uh, drop in the in the future. And then, I mean, the reputations of being the one of the best online ads uh, companies, right, will be, will be uh, shaken. Uh. So that, that's my concern, uh. But anyway, I haven't sold out my entire positions. I sold one quarter. Uh, for now, just uh, wait and see approach. Uh, and also, I, I bought into uh, Google right, when they announced that uh, 20 for 1 split. So uh, that's some increase in exposure. So basically, I'm taking money from, from uh, Meta and move a little bit to, to Google. So that's my minor tweaking um, over the past week. Um, yeah, do I... Yeah, we have more people joining in. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining. So, uh, I'll just stop here, pause here for a second. Just want to uh, look around, see anyone have any uh, 
things to share? What was your, what's your take on Facebook? And uh, are you buying the deep or are you like, do you have any price target and so on? J just want, want to see any, any response. Good morning. I saw Chicken also join. Chicken, you want to share your view? <laughs> Hi, morning. Uh, morning. My view, I I don't think it's deep value lah. Cause I was on I was on YouTube, I was on Twitter, and I'm like looking at different sources, and like the quote unquote value investing community has been shouting that it's a deep value lah. So I went to I spent the last few days. I went to go and see the business, go and look at other people's um, financial statement, and come up with my own model lah. And I actually think that my numbers are quite close to uh, Boon Song's number, actually. I think it's kind of at fair value now. Uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> actually, whether it's deep value or not um, also depends on what growth assumption that you put in, right? Because if you just look at, uh, let's say, the past two years, three years, uh, the past growth rate is, was quite high, right? So let's say 2021, I think they are growing like 30 plus uh, percent, right? So if you just assume that all this DAU drop is, is just a blip, it will go back and then they will monetize more out of the user that they have now, right? Assuming a 20 to 30 percent growth for another, let's say, two to three years and then slow down to 15% growth is still something that is not a very aggressive assumption, right? If you put in that uh, kind of growth assumption, PE of let's say 16 or 17 will be actually quite quite dirt cheap, right? Mm, I don't disagree, but uh, now because there's a very big problem with the CapEx, right? So I think the projected CapEx for Facebook in the coming year, will rise by 70% year on year. So what, what I did was because now the capex for metaverse is very debatable. We don't know, we don't know what will happen. And uh, it's a very big bet to a very big question now. So you increase capex and my top line, I, 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 I'm quite conservative. Lah, so I didn't, I didn't put like a 15, 20%. I let it grow for 10%. And then assuming that they can settle Apple's iOS and whatever, and they managed to pivot, then I, increase the growth rate back again to 15, then 15, 15, and then I flatline 10. Uh, I get around the current price though, which is 240, which is why that time I think when I discussed with uh, Bunti also, uh, sometimes the market is like, it's true that the market overreacts sometimes, but uh, also means that, might mean that some people know some stuff and and not every time the market is, is uh, overreacting and being emotion, emotional, emotional lah. That's about it. But yeah, uh, I, I don't disagree. I'm quite, my, my, my DCF, if I release, will probably trigger quite a lot of people because it's extremely conservative. And I presume that the entire metaverse thing don't play out. Uh, like they just burn for another probably three years. Then maybe they wake up and say, that, oh, let's, let's, let's scale down our CapEx and focus back onto our family of apps. Then yeah, lor, then it will revert back to current prices. Yeah, actually, I, I have a question. Uh, I mean, to, to anyone who know the details, right? They announced the metaverse. I remember they have some products, uh, like, like a product roadmap that will come in soon, right? For example, like the Facebook, uh, the Meta Horizon, something like that. I, I don't recall the exact name. So they plan to have something that will replace, let's say, uh, Concord, right? Um, so, so you have this metaverse world. I, I don't know exactly, like, um, like, let's say, one year, two year, three years, right? What are we, what can we reasonably expect to see in terms of the products, right? Both on the hardware uh, side and also the software. I watched a bit on, on the, on the um, YouTube, YouTube videos where they share what they're going to launch, but also not very clear. To, to me, it's still very like, um, how to say, not even beta, right? It's just some something Anyone have any insight in terms of what, what they're going to come up soon? Like, let's say this year. Hello, Daniel. Are you there? Can, can you speak? 
maybe just want to hear your thought because you are very into this metaverse uh, area, right? What about others? Yeah, one question is: is the is the KPEX gonna uh, gonna search by a lot? Because from my from what I see, right, their, their free cash flow has been increasing every quarter, right, for the year. Like first quarter two hundred two one was about seven point nine billion, and second quarter eight point six billion, third quarter nine point seven billion, and this current quarter was about twelve point seven billion, right? So it's it's free cash flow is actually increasing every quarter, and the KPEX is not increasing that fast, or right? it's still stagnating about four to five billion, right? Yeah, I, I'm sharing the the page that's showing the quarterly um, numbers. I think the there are two concerns, right? One is that okay, um, this uh, reality labs is not something like they just come up last quarter, right? So you, you've seen investment into this area since I think two or three years back, and then if you look at the revenues, right, compared to a year ago, uh, it didn't grow much. So that means we don't see anything concrete at the moment. But if you look at the uh, loss, right, then you see a lot of, um, um, I, I, I mean, it keep on increasing, right? So let's say 3.3 billion loss here. This is one quarter, right? So they're going to burn like 10 plus billion for a couple of years in the future. But in the what, what they get in return, right, is, is still very, um, like very unknown, right? So all this uncertainty will, will definitely create some some concerns, uh, and not every investor, you know, I, I think that, that's how I see it, right? In, among the Facebook investors, if you break up this into two different business, let's say they just split their metaverse, right? Become another companies, right? Then it's clear that there are investors who bought into Facebook just just because of their legacy business. Then there are investors who are very uh, bullish on metaverse, right? Then they will say, okay, let, let's go for the metaverse one. But what happens now is that I think on the metaverse, not much product. We don't see any ramping, any any uh, increase in the revenues significantly. Very hard to imagine, right? Uh, whether it will turn out as a success. And then on the ad business, we see that uh, they slow down. So they guide the Q1 quarter, like uh, around 10% 10 10 growth, right? So definitely that's very concerning. Uh. And then I think the, the drop, like 20 plus percent drop in single day, is just that instead of like projecting, let's say 20 or 30% growth, for the next few years now, you have to project a uh, 10 or maybe 15% growth, right? So, so there's a little bit of uh, extrapolation also that caused the, the sharp drop. Uh. I, th I think the drop is quite fair like, in, in my personal opinion, uh, on view, on view. <laughs> uh, Bunji, maybe I can scroll to page 17. Uh, I think with regards to the free cash flow, right? So now if you look at like the 2021, the free cash flow is around 40B. If you add up four quarters, then the capex, the you you don't you don't look at the net cash, you look at the bottom the the middle two, it's around uh eighteen to nineteen B. The problem is I think in one in the remarks, right? Under the remarks, they actually guided twenty nine to thirty four B in capex. So that's actually a seventy to seventy five percent increase in capex for 2022 alone and the cash burning will continue lah. so i think it depends on how you look at um, the roi of their reality labs so that's another 10 billion increase right compared to 2021 yeah around there i can show my rough dcf lah later yeah, yeah yeah whenever you are ready you can show I just want to hear more opinions. We have quite a number of people that have joined. Anyone want to share your view on, on Facebook, like whether you did, you think they are fine? I, I think on, when, when we chat in the chat, uh, chat group, right, there are like very various uh, views, right? Some will say this is uh, temporary stuff. And then some are quite bearish, right? Just want to hear anyone have any view on If not, then we will just move on. Uh, um, or Chicken, do you want to share your DCF? Or, or we, shall we go to the slide? 
Can. As in, because I wanted to solicit opinion on the TCF on the way two mm. Yeah, you can, you can take over, you can share your screen. Okay. Uh, can see, right? Oh, wait, a bit small. Yep. Okay, so this these are the numbers. Um, I didn't really extract from... I didn't extract from uh, the actual financial statement because so the numbers might be a bit weird. I use Cap IQ, um, which is another. It's a it's a paid platform lah, but I got it for free in, from my school. So essentially, this is the net free cash flow for twenty twenty one, which is around forty b, give or take, and the capex they guided twenty nine to thirty three b. So that's around a sixty five to seventy five percent increase. And that's just um, um, for this lah. So I not to wh why I use these few numbers is because um, they actually guided three to eleven percent. I would think that it's a short term problem. So after they settle their apple and whatever nonsense, it will go back up again, and then I just flatline ten percent. And for K capex, um, this is guaranteed kind of. This number is is guided by the CFO lah. So I don't think the pro the, the, the there will be any uncertainty. So the problem now is. In the future, how you're gonna guide it outwards in the next four to five years? Then terminal multiple, I understand that it might be a little bit on the low side because if I'm not wrong, Facebook has constantly been trading at at least thirty to fifty free cash flow multiple. But don't don't say it won't happen now because um, even Alibaba is trading at ten times free cash flow multiple today. So it really depends on the growth trajectory at 2026 and how they guide accordingly. Then uh, my WAC, I know it's a very big WAC um, or discount rate, however you want to call it. And I think people like Adam Koo or Everything Money, they actually use quite a con like quite an aggressive WAC of 10 to like I, some use 8, some use 10. Um, in this case, if you look online for consensus of the cost of capital, I think it's from the range of 5 to 8%. But the issue is, I think Facebook actually didn't have that until 2019. So 2018 and before, they it was all equity. Then they only started taking on that in the last three years. So need to use, actually, I think using cost of equity might be more, um, it might be more transparent. Uh, and in a way, because Facebook actually didn't, don't need to use um, that in this case. But 12.5% is really um, being extremely uh, aggressive in my assumption that um, they they are going to probably screw up their meta. Lah. So that's why I get uh, my, my price target is not too far away from today's prices. So that's why I don't think like it's deep, deep value. Lah. So this is just my baseline assumption. But of course, you can play with the numbers. Lah. Yeah. So actually, from the numbers that you are showing, right? Um, hey. Okay, sorry. Uh, the numbers that you're showing, the free cash flow to, for 2021 was 39 billions, right? How come keep on flipping back? <laughs> 39 billions, right? But now uh, your, your projection on 2022 is 28 billions. Correct. Yeah, so it because will be a huge capex. drop, right? Yeah. Because of the capex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so, yeah, just now we talk about the capex of uh, uh, additional around 10 billion or so. I think that that makes sense. Yeah, you, my, my, uh, my own calculation, I think this one I shared uh, briefly on, uh, I, I shared on the group, right? Just want to walk through like, um, because I, I didn't look at the cash flow. Uh, I, I just look at their revenue income and look at their margin and see what is the likely impact, right? Because for example, let's say if we don't know the details, right? We just say, okay, uh, they, their net income was um, 46.7 uh, billion for 2021. And then we look at their growth, right? It was like 43% increase uh, in one year, right? If we say, okay, uh, I, I'm being conservative, I can use like 30 or 25% growth in, in the next three or five years, right? But this one may not be correct because if you look at the breakdown of uh, the segments, right? Uh, actually, they say that the revenues will grow by 3 to 11% uh, in the first quarter, not the entire year. So here I put in 15%, right? Just to be more aggressive, uh, than their guidance. And then we just look at, okay, let's assume that the family of apps, their margins stay the same. And then um, their reality labs, right? They're going to continue to make uh, uh, losses here. So it will increase 
just a couple of billions more, right? Just a three billion increase in terms of losses compared to 2021. And then based on this calculation, I noticed that their net income will actually drop, uh, or sorry, will actually increase by around 10%. So, and these numbers is considered aggressive already because if the losses or the capex in the reality labs is going to increase further, right? Let's say uh, like 10 billions, right? Actually, we should expect to see even like a flat or drop in net income. So that's why I say without, if we just look at the aggregate numbers, right, we may not see like what's the likely impact. But if you just study like what, what, how much they're going to spend in, in all these metaverse related projects, right? Um, like whether they are able to maintain the current net income or free cash flow is a question mark, unless they really scale down. Uh, which also may not be a good thing if one, if let's say, uh, end of this year, they say they're going to uh, scale down their effort in, uh, metaverse. Then I think that's even worse, right? Then investors will say, ah, oh, they, they, they know that they will screw up or there's no market for, for metaverse. It's too early. This kind of things, right? That's even worse. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think from what I read, right, the capex 29, 29 billion to 34 billion next year, right, it's not solely on Meta alone, you know. Because Facebook is actually, although I'm not a investor, lah, but I've been reading, I think um, they are quite reactive, right? For example, the Snap, they use uh, Insta Live to counteract, and then TikTok, they use uh, Insta Reel, right, to counteract, to, to, to prevent disruption. Lah. So actually, of all these video uh, algo uh, segments, right, they need a lot of money for from what Rainer we, we uh, said, right, he said a large factor driving the increase in CAPEX spend is an investment in our AI and machine learning capabilities, which we expect to benefit our efforts in ranking and recommendations for experiences across our products, including in feeds and video. I think they, they, they are trying to up their AI recommendation, just like TikTok, they're trying to compete with TikTok. So even if you talk about 34 billion CAPEX, right, they are, they are, they are net cash, they are, they are net cash currently it's quite huge, right? It's, it's, it's also about net 33 billion, right? So they are basically just using their net cash uh, for next year. And I, and I believe their operating cash flow will continue to increase uh, because this kind of business, advertising business is quite a sticky one. Like 200 million businesses, they have Facebook presence uh, in the whole world and only 10, 10 million businesses use their uh, advertising. Uh, so I think the... The, the rate of usage is still quite low. And also, there are also other uh, potentials that is not tapped yet. Like, for example, uh, WhatsApp, 2 billion users. The monetization is so low. No? One If, if $1 ARPU is, is really worth 2, bil uh, two billion, uh, if you talk about $10, that's about 20 billion already. So, it's I mean, Facebook is always a value counter. Like, um, because their financials are quite... Are quite are quite there. Like, for example, yeah, gross margin is very high, one, about 88 to 81 percent. EBIT margin is very high, about 40 percent. ROIC is about 70 percent. So, I think in general, the management is always trying to prevent disruption by copying other, copying the current trends, right? And, and then input their own, uh, their, their own uh, programs to counteract with the current trends. Uh. So, uh, I don't know. I think I think the the capex, the, the large capex that you said next year that they will use, right? It's just it, it's just their net cash la, amount. Yeah, I think that that's uh, definitely good things uh, because they have accumulated so much cash, right? So, um, they I mean compared to some other let's say smaller caps companies, right? They they want to do any capex or, or R and D, they really need to ask or raise capital in the open markets, right? So if the share price drop, then uh, they can only raise at a huge dilution, right? That's definitely a, a very bad thing. But for Facebook, they they don't need outside money, that's for sure. They can just fund it with their current cash and also their uh, cash flow from the legacy business now. So I think this is still very strong. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah. What? Two to one alone, right? They have already turned out close to forty billion of free cash flow. Just saying. Yeah, that, that's definitely their strength, and also their uh, ability to really copy very fast, right? 
I think uh, when the clubhouse is going like crazy, they also come up with similar uh, tools in, in a short period of time. Now Reels is um, like trying to defend against TikTok. I think this is also yeah. doing improving a lot, right? So all these uh, countermeasures, I think all these individual like Reels and all these, even though it, it looks like a copycat kind of thing, right? But I think they, all, all these have, has potential. Uh, I mean, uh, over the long long term uh, to compete with TikTok, because TikTok is, is, is burning a lot of cash. And Facebook is free cash flow, positive and growing. So ultimately, who will win is, is still uh, is still a guess. A guess la. But now they are actually increasing their capex to to investments that is quite necessary, la, like AI and machine learning, which is actually for their, their in-feed and video products, actually. Yep. Anyone else have any view, want to share? If not, we will go to the Slido. Okay, um, if no, we will just quickly walk through the, the questions. I think we have quite a number of questions also. Uh, <laughs> first question, I saw Baba and but Facebook, usually when I see Alibaba questions, I think this one come up in every week. Uh, so uh, I will just skip because we don't have people who can give good comments, right? But since we have chicken here today, you want to give any response to, to these questions? I just want to say congrats. Huh? Uh, I hope you didn't buy before the earnings, but if you bought in the day, I, I don't think it's an expensive company. And, and yeah. That's about it. <laughs> you, you also notice that quite a number of people who invested in Baba are also in, interested with Facebook, right? Because these are all like considered lower PE companies, right? Uh, I, I don't think it's lower PE because it's quite funny. I was on my Discord, right? Then I was talking to them. It was a very interesting phenomenon that people that are interested in companies like Facebook or Baba is always... Um, whenever they're like negative news or like the company cannot make it or the entire narrative change, right? Then people are like, eh, is there like value in this? Or, or like you're always attracted by um, a negative uh, event that comes out. <laughs> so I think it's just that bunch of same, same bunch of people that's interested in, in companies and want to see whether is it a sustainable problem or is it a short term problem. I think for for how to say uh, um I think these investors are also a bit like contrarian investor, right? So whenever price drop a lot, they will they will, they will try to find values and see uh and, and will think that the market has overreacted, and then by being a contrarian investor, you can get uh more returns. Uh, and, and those who s uh, sell off the position after the drop because of all these di different concerns, right? These are the so called um trend followers are uh, those, those who follow <laughs> follow the market so definitely i think um, there are some similarities between <laughs> between alibaba and facebook uh. hope that facebook don't don't drop so much uh. <laughs> anyone else want to comment on this or you i personally invested in both and i, I just checked my allocations uh, my, my, my allocation to these two are quite uh, like very small percentage now like around two percent Quite similar. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Odds of Metaverse VR being successful. I personally haven't used VR before, so it's very hard for me to comment uh, based on my, my experience. Anyone use VR before? Are you, are you bullish on this uh, on this area? Do you want to share your experience? Really, no one has used before. All quiet. <laughs> then, then if no, I'll just give a very like general comment on this. Uh. So I, I think uh, same for like, you know, uh, smartphone adoptions, right? Uh, they, I think they, they are like one killer app away from being become, become a mainstream. Uh. I still remember for, let's say, smartphones, right? Uh, the app is always, the, the first one is always the WhatsApp and also Viber, uh, these two. Uh, I start, started using them since, I think, 2011. 
around 2011. That was like 11 years ago, right? So it's not because I want a smartphone, then I bought a smartphone and then use all these apps. It's because I need the app. I need the WhatsApp app and then I bought a smartphone, right? So I think for, for Metaverse, it was, it's going to be the same thing again. So once you have friends that is uh, on some app that is very popular and then you need a VR to join the game, right? That's, that's when uh, they will become mainstream. Now. But of course, they need to provide a good uh, user experience uh, uh, in order to achieve that. And I don't know um, how soon it will happen now. So I, I think it could as soon as, let's say this year or, or in the next two or three years. Uh. But I mean, coming from Facebook, when they spend so much uh, money uh, and basically pivot their business into Metaverse, I think they they see more than us. Uh. For example, they, they already have a lot of R&D that, that's promising. It's just that um, takes some time to roll out, right? So, and all these new products is always will take a few years to become mature la. so you know like apple they launched their apple watch right the first version is always stuck right so then after three or four years you see uh the products getting better and and that's that's how they create an entire new line of business la. i believe it will be the same for for facebook as well but uh, it's really hard to give like some some um how to say it's uh good insight without using the products la. so so that's my comment on this but Anyone like, else want to share? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It's like metaverse. I think it, it can. I think usually people will assume that metaverse will only be successful if it's tech to games, right? Like Tencent or Microsoft. They they, they invested uh, a lot of money into buying buying game companies. Right? All these people, all these companies. I mean, they should benefit more from metaverse, right? Like like Roblox or this. Uh, compared to Facebook, I, I don't think like how how do you make it sticky? I think the most they can do is to sell the peripherals like Oculus, right? I don't, I don't think um, like 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 short social users will 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 use metaverse excessively. Right? I I I'm not very sure in this uh, in this segment also. Maybe you can is anyone know can uh, expand on it. I think it's different right the experience when it comes to social because for example right now right we are chatting it's a bit like metaverse already because i'm i'm, I'm, at, I'm at my home you are at your home so we are chatting but we don't have this like a 3d kind of uh, immersion kind of feeling right because we, we are basically flat you know so anyone can speak it's, it's totally flat i don't see i don't feel you uh like just sitting beside me right but once you have this metaverse right we can have a round table discussion and then we can look around and then we can uh give some you know let's say some facial expression it can can also be recorded and be be transferred right so that kind of thing like really give you a feel that uh people's presence uh, which is around, I think that feeling, uh, you, you cannot do it using the current technology, like all the, like Zoom or, or I mean, this kind of co co conference call apps, right? So really, really need that. Uh. So I, I think it's not just game. Uh. Game is definitely one important segment, but it's also the social part, uh. like talking uh, with friends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, there is this platform called Spatial Chat. I can share it uh, in the chat. It's something very, very interesting that uh, I wouldn't say it's what the metaverse will look like, but I would say this is what the metaverse will very closely resemble. <laughs> because it's quite interesting. You guys can go take a look. Um, this might solve the social uh, part of the issue that, uh, that it was brought up. So yeah, it was quite interesting how you can sort of, it, it's, only, it's not only for working, but it's also for social stuff as well. So, uh, I mean, you can go take a look at this, might change your perspective. Check the, the, Microsoft, the Microsoft CEO, right? He said the metaverse is just games, really. So what he means is that, yeah, like, there's social element to it, like for example, meetings, but I think you won't buy an Oculus just for that, right? It's not, it's, it's just for aesthetic purposes. There's no function to it. So I think what he says is that um, in the end, the whole concept of metaverse, right, all boils down to those companies with massive amount of IPs. That's why they are buying a lot of those game companies. Uh. I think in the end, the gamers are the ones that will immerse themselves in metaverse uh, and they'll, they'll be the ones that are sticky. Yeah, would, would you like to walk around 
in your office inside the metaverse, <laughs> interacting with your colleagues and so on. But I, I think this type of thing would only apply for bigger companies. Uh, small companies won't even think of doing this, but it'll be companies that are like of Facebook, Google type of level where they might implement this just for the workplace as a as a fun experience. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I have a question. Uh, actually, how 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 is Facebook gonna make money from the metaverse? Um, and also, you know, this metaverse, right? Um, it, it is is there only gonna be one metaverse, or are there gonna be multiple metaverses? You know, yeah. I I can try to answer the money making part. Um, I think it's quite simple, right? Because as of now, how they make money, right, is basing is use, using the eyeballs, right. So, whenever you are on the platform, you can there, there's space, right. Then you can look around, and then there's place for them to place apps, meaning that uh, some logo, something that's moving, something that attract your attention, and then you can look into the product, which is advertisements, right. So, I think similar things with metaverse. It's just that instead of uh, you are scrolling the Facebook page and look at. Uh, the ads right now you are basically living in that metaverse space and then inside there they can also show uh, uh ad advertisement right and advertisements is not just like really like the banner that kind of things right it could be like some product placement anything that get your attention for example you walk around and then you see people uh play certain games or you walk around inside the metaverse and then you can see uh people using certain uh, uh product uh they they, they eat McDonald's inside there. I mean, scene like this, right, will actually, uh, like, like how to say, uh, get you attracted to certain kind of products. And those uh, eyeballs, right, can always be monetized, right? So I, I don't see, like, a big difference in terms of the monetization. So it's still the same. It's still uh, monetizing based on eyeballs. Uh. And, and your second question on with regards to how many metaverse, I think also it really depends on how you define like what is one metaverse, right? So I think like now we are like um, chatting together with everyone here in one small room like this, right? So I, I, can this be considered like one metaverse? Because inside this room, we can have certain characteristics, certain things that we can do, right? Then you can also have uh, another group that is different, larger, have more tools, and then you have and have a mega one, for example, like a Twitter space where you can interact with anyone, right? You can have uh, hundreds of millions of users on there. So I think depending on how you define, you can define that as like all different metaverse or all of them. If you say uh, it's all managed by the same developer and once they roll out one specific tool, it can be rolled out to other places as well, right? Then you can also consider this entire thing as one metaverse, right? So it's, it really depends on how, how you uh, like define, like what, what do you mean by metaverse? I see, I see. Thanks. Um, are, are there any companies that are looking to create uh, uh, metaverses as well? other than Facebook? I think there are, there are many, right? I think just now also, I think Kevin uh, mentioned, right? Like Microsoft already in, in this space for quite some time. Uh, Apple, I think is also developing something. We don't know how soon they will come up with something. Um, and then all the gaming companies, Roblox, all this, they are also like, either they are already developing it or their current offerings or their current products, right, can be extrapolated, not extrapolated, like, can, be, can be used as a base to build something that is uh, related to, to uh, Metaverse. Uh. I see, thanks, thanks. Because I'm, I'm thinking, right, because I, I don't know whether you guys notice or not, I, I, I'm using like TikTok, right? So I think in the past, TikTok is just like, okay, showing short, Form content uh, video, and then uh, I also noticed that there are people like just sharing anything that they want to share. Uh, they just uh, hit there, and then the guy just talking. And then after a while, I noticed that okay, these people right on uh, TikTok right, they looks uh, prettier than usual. So there are filter uh, that help to enhance their appearance. All all this requires some AI tools behind the scene, uh, and they can apply that right. So. The reason I, I bring up this is that I think 
if we meet in real life, right? So you basically have, I mean, especially for girls, right, they have to put up their makeup to make that they, to, to to make themselves uh, look more attractive, right? But once you're on metaverse, right? Actually, you don't have to do this uh, like physically. You just need to apply a filter, right? Then you can be seen as a, a lot more attractive, right? So all these things, I think, uh, is the selling point or, or what makes metaverse. Uh, even more attractive as compared to uh, real life. Uh, other than, you know, in real life, if you want to meet someone, you have to travel. It could be like long distance, but on Metaverse, people just need to log in and they are at the uh, same same place, right? This is definitely one one uh, selling point. The other selling point is like, I think the other AI stuff, like things that make you more attractive. Uh, yeah, I think this is always something that will, will help, you know, it will give you the different kind of experience and, and not a, just a replacement. Like, like it doesn't just replace the fact that we can talk to each other. It really gives you a lot of different things, you know. So I think this is where, where they are heading. Uh. And, you know, these companies that focus a lot on all this AI stuff, right, they are the ones that will, will do well, you know, because there will be a lot of uh, all this AI stuff in the metaverse. It's all software, you know. Guys, can you hear me? Yes, very soft, very soft, very soft. Oh. I let me let me mix up your mic. I can hear but uh, very soft. Sorry about that. I'm on a hit, wireless headset. Um, there's a company called Linden Labs. Um, 2003, they started a company called Second Life, still running. That is probably the earliest example of a metaverse. Second Life is still running, um, and you can look at how they monetize because it's free to enter. Uh, basically, anyone who wants to advertise, whether it's universities or brands, they get SDK. They just they can build facilities where users can attend and go to um, or interact with. So it's just it's not just logos and ads. It's actually you can build the facilities or the rooms in which people will congregate. So it's much more immersive than uh, eyeballs, lah. It's the actual presence and the interaction with the user that is. Uh, they'll probably be, uh, they will heighten the ARPU uh, significantly. Lah. So that's how they monetize and they've been around. I mean, usage has been fallen because it's not a VR. But Metaverse and VR, while closely rated, don't have to be together. It's just a universe of universes whereby people can just uh, immerse themselves inside. Yeah. Similar to Roblox? Uh, I can't answer that. I've not uh, seen Roblox, but this is okay. early concept, lah. Yeah, yeah. And and I think it's crypto. Um, back back then when Second Life came out, there was another company called First Meta. Uh, my friend actually started it. Um, basically, um, basically there there was a currency in Linden Labs called Linden Cash or something like that. And First Meta was um, responsible for washing the money into US dollars, where you can purchase US dollars and. Uh, use it to buy linden, linden dollars and then you can use linden dollars to purchase stuff in the the metaverse in the second life and i can foresee crypto a special crypto being used maybe uh, facebook was called like libre but i think they changed the name or something like that facebook will also use their own crypto as a currency of exchange yeah yeah, basically, it's not just creating product anymore um, or services, right? This is like creating an economy, right? So that, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, in a way. Then, then they can essentially become a country, lah, so they can tax the citizens. <laughs> yeah, I think that's definitely the, the goals. Uh, if they can create something like that, that will be very, very uh, impressive. Okay, I think um, let's go to the next questions. What's uh, Facebook fair value? I think just now, um, Chicken has shown the DCF, right? You, you, you've seen his uh, growth rate. So for, for me, right, I, I would say, like, you know, uh, following Professor Damodaran approach, right? First, you need to um, have a story and then you you build the DCF based on that story. 
So I think the story that Chicken had just now is that um, we, we are expecting that the free cash flow will, will slow down and then just to uh, put in more conservative into the assumption and hence you get something like a fair value of not far from today's share price. So uh, I would say that that's uh, definitely one one of the scenario that can play out. And then I think two more scenarios is that let's say if you see this uh, drop in DAU, all these things is just temporary and they might even uh, scale down their... Uh, their uh, investment into metaverse and then they can uh, monetize their WhatsApp, all these things, right? I mean, you can come up with a story that can justify a higher growth. I think $300 uh, fair value, I think is not aggressive, uh, not, not too aggressive if you believe on that. Uh. And then also another scenario, which is a lot more pessimistic, which is the one that I mentioned, right? Like BAU continue to drop and then people realize that, hey, actually uh, Facebook is really a platform that is declining and then uh, it will shrink, right? In terms of user and so on. I think that one, you have, if you prepare a DCF, I think you easily it can drop to 150. So so I think the range is somewhere between this range. Uh. So I haven't done one for myself um, because I am focusing a lot more on the trajectory of the business and the narrative and and not really on the specific numbers of that, that quarters. Uh. So to, to me, if I believe the story is towards the the um like the recovery right then I, I have no problem to add the positions uh, but right now as of now i i um to me my, my assessment is that the downside is more than upside uh, because the, they are losing the narrative already yeah anyone else have done any fair value fair, fair value dcf or anything to want to share your 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 take uh, with regards to the fair value If no, let's move on. Um, anyone think that other big companies, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon can sustain the year-on-year -year growth market getting more saturated by each day, so just increase product prices? I think this one is a very, uh, yeah, I, I do agree with the, uh, with the observation. We've seen that Amazon has increased their uh, prime subscription fee, right? So Microsoft also increased their Microsoft 365 or Office 365 prices. Uh, Netflix also increased their prices. What else? Uh, Google, not so obvious. Uh, Google, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I, I think that's definitely true. Uh, like these big companies, they can just increase the price and then uh, it, will sh it will flow through the revenue and you see the, the revenue growth, right? So that, that's definitely true. But I think uh, at that's on one end, right? On the other end, I will also say that for all these companies, right, I think they are still doing a lot of things, right, when it comes to their R&D and their product offerings. Maybe not every companies have, like, keep on creating new business lines. Right? I don't think that is the case. I think they are, they already have something that is, uh, have traction and they just keep building on top. So say, say for Amazon, right? I think for those who are not using uh, like AWS, you might not know like what is happening behind the scene. Actually, they are build, building a lot of things. Right? You know, there are like uh, numbers, hundreds of like small startup within the AWS. You know, just to keep on uh, coming up with new services, new offerings, and so on. So those are also uh, like new avenues uh, of growth. Uh. So I think it's true if you say just price increases. I think this is true and also true that aside from the price increase, they, they are also growing in, in other lines, but not something that is like a huge pivot. Like say, for example, uh, Apple also, let's say they come up with a VR and then you see the VR has said may maybe their initial revenue is also very small, but if it if they gain traction, right, it will eventually become a, a separate business line, just how, just like how the Apple Watch is doing, right, or their AirPods is doing, right. So all this will take time to ramp up now. So I, I just want to give assurance that at least for the companies that I'm following, right, they are, they are not like stopping R and D and every year just in increase prices, you know, because we, we all know that if they just keep on in increase prices, this is definitely not sustainable. Uh, but they are working on a lot of things that will help with their with their business expansion. Anyone else want to share your view with, 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 uh, on this comment, or on these questions?
If no, let's move on. If a profitable business is not growing so much anymore, then the PE will get slowly reduced to bank's PE. I'm not sure who asked this question. You want to elaborate a bit uh, because it's a bit general. Are, are we talking about Facebook here approaching PE of banks? Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, a, a bit hard to like just give general comment because I don't know what are we talking about. If there's a specific company, it's easier to discuss. Uh. Mm, but in generally speaking, let's say if a business is uh, not growing anymore, like you don't see much R&D, uh, the business last year compared to this year is the same business, then that's true that I mean, I mean the, the best example is like banks. Uh. You look at uh, DBS Bank last year versus this year, right? I mean, how much has changed, right? So if, if nothing much has changed on the business, not much R&D, not, not much new business case or business ideas, right? So they will essentially, they, I mean, in terms of their growth will also like track to like the country's GDP growth, right? Which is usually very low, like, like 3%, 4%, that kind of growth, right? So that's when the PE also become like like very low. La. So because nothing much to look forward to why, why you are paying a high PE for, for these companies, right? Yeah, so I think that's the, the generous statement. I, I do agree with this statement, but um, we need to see, right? Because sometimes even, uh, let's say Apple, right? There will be period where their top line growth is also like, like single digit, right? So there might be some slowdown in in iPhones, slowdown in their revenues. I think these are quite common. Or let's say in a particular year, right? You see the iPhone uh, that that they that they launch, right? Is about the same as the previous year iPhone. So not much reason to for an upgrade, right? So that year's business might drop. I think this is quite common. Um, it will happen like in certain years, right? In fact, for Apple's case, it happened a, a few times already since uh, in the past 10 years. So I think this is okay. But the kind of slowing growth, nothing happened. I, I'm referring to the business, like they, they are not even working on uh, expansion or R&D. So, so two different types of slowdown. One is temporary. Another one is like permanently, you don't see anything one. <laughs> so it's very different. Uh. So we need to uh, separate the, these two. I think for, 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 for Facebook, right, um, let's say if you are not, you, you don't own the operating system like uh, Apple or Google, right, and you are just under them, uh, I think that we, we should also factor in a terminal value. Uh, because if you talk about uh, dollar cost, uh, uh, you got, uh, di discounting cash flow and growth, yeah, right? Not? It's not it's not very accurate because the thing is, um, once the, the numbers are saturated, right, like for example, Yahoo Chat, MSN Messenger, BB Chat, all these they get, they, they fade away over time. So you need a huge amount of capex or reinvestment to actually grow other segments uh, so that you can actually survive, you know. So so all, all these, uh, maybe the the, P, the low PE of Facebook is actually ju justified uh, to me. So the thing is, the, the high capex is also justified. It really depends on how it turns out uh, in the end. So it's very hard to uh, do a, a DSC model on it. Yeah, I think the just to build on top of your point, right? I think it's a bit like winners take all, right? Because, um, I mean, why Facebook is so successful is also because of network effect, right? So it, it's not because of their product is so good that people stay on on the platform. Yeah, like, let's, let's say ask your friends, like, uh, have you have you are you all still using Facebook? And most of them will say no, but then the the, the investors will say, oh, just look at the numbers. The numbers tell a different story. But how long can this last, right? So now the numbers are slowly reflecting what the actual users are experiencing. So it's quite dangerous, actually. Yeah, true, true. Agree. Because you see, we, we are all on Telegram already. <laughs> then your friends that they are not on Telegram, they will slowly move on to Telegram because they're seeing more good stuff there, right? So, um, and the experience is just better, right? So I think this change, right, it will move very slow. Then slowly, 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 then suddenly everyone is on another platform already because the network effect is not uh, helping Facebook anymore but helping other platforms. If other platforms are, are much better, right? So they, they have, I mean, they have they have to spend on the KPEX uh, just to make sure that in terms of their product offering, they're still the best, right? Uh, 
So it's a bit like binary outcome. Either they able to sustain and then become better and keep the users or within a couple of years, then suddenly it will just collapse. Like, yeah, and I think uh, the users significant... do, not have, do not have much loyalty or they, they, can, they can switch very, very fast. Uh, true, true, true. Okay, uh, next one. If one exposure to Metaverse invest in Unity is a more direct and currently at great price too, anyone invested in Unity want to give any of your, your view or your, your take on this? I, I do agree with this statement, you know, like um, if you are very bullish on Metaverse, uh, I think invest in Unity because Unity, they are like, providing the tool, right, for those who want to create all this 3D content and so on, right? I think this is really a more direct approach to get exposure. And not just Unity, right? There are quite a number of other companies also in, in this uh, area. For example, like Nvidia is also one good example, right? So Nvidia, AMD, regardless of which services that you, you, you are going to build in the metaverse, right? I mean, the hardware part, um, you still fall back to AMD, NVIDIA, or even TSMC, right? Because you need more chips to power all this metaverse, right? TSMC, Samsung, this, these are the one that uh, is more uh, stable because they provide the infrastructure, right? Or even AWS, like Amazon, right? These are also like good, good, uh, um, how to say, good uh, options for you to get into it. But I also do want to say like, when this metaverse become like a uh, full blown, right? Like let's say 10 years later, right? Who will grab the most upside from the metaverse will be the uh, service uh, that, that built on top of all this infrastructure. So the big winners, right? They, they will get, get most of them. And the problem is we, we don't know who will be the big winners, right? It could be uh, Meta or Facebook, right? Or, or it could be other companies, but they get a lot more. For example, like you just look at the uh, TSMC build the chips, right? They're manufacturing the chips and then NVIDIA just uh, uh, design the chips, right? But most of the upside actually uh, accrue to NVIDIA instead of uh, TSMC. But if you compare the two, right? TSMC is always the, the safer investment because if NVIDIA lose, right? Then another chip designers, they will also use uh, uh, TSMC. So the, the weapon manufacturer is always the one that is uh, safer, but uh, they don't gain, they don't capture the full upside now. So I, I think this is how you can see it now. Just want to bring in some analogy. Well, our friend is still here. Eh? <laughs> can I sue chicken for my Alibaba losses after so long, Baba still never go up? <laughs> chicken, you want to respond on this? Uh? Do you have your uh, lawyer? <laughs> Uh, I think we might get more money for bigger Baba bulls out there. They got 300,000 subscribers. So you might want to find them first. Yeah, this one, I just see this as a joke. I don't, don't, uh, I think it's just, uh, don't, don't pay too much attention. Uh, because we, we, I still don't know who's this person, you know. If, if you, if you are here, you can unmute and then just share with us what's your story. How come, uh, like you are invested in Alibaba? We, we like story, you know, you, you can unmute and, and share with us. You see, no, no one wants to admit us, so a bit, a bit difficult, you know, like we are talking with Anonymous, so a bit tough. <laughs> okay, next one. If one exposure, hey, this, this one we talked about already. Okay, this is question for me. You mentioned that you are pretty sure that the market hasn't bottomed. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think this one, I'll, I'll just say two things. Uh, um, number one is that if you look at current price versus the so-called the recent bottoms, right? Last night I checked, it's only like 6% away. And then uh, just to give you some, some ideas, right? If we just look at S&P 500, you look at the monthly volatility, right? It's about, let's say, 4% each. So you only need like 1.5 uh, standard deviation uh, just to for, for the stock to drop below the recent low. And 1.5 standard deviation for a monthly time step, right? It's like, it could happen anytime, you know? Like even if it doesn't happen in the next month, right? 
So you just take like two months, right? So of course the the volatility will will increase. It's not four point five percent, right? You only need like let's say one standard deviation move for it to drop below uh, the recent low. So what I'm saying is that. Um, for that statement, like, okay, uh, market already bottom. For this statement to be true, right, the fluctuation of the S&P 500, had, it, it cannot cross the line of the recent low. Uh, I mean, just from a probability point of view, it's just like very small chance it will be true. Uh. I haven't run the numbers. I can do one uh, on if you are interested. <laughs> but I would just say the, the this statement, like market has bottom, um, just from probability point of view is very low. Uh. So <laughs> this is this is not like I, I will paint a story like oh market is going to uh gloom and doom kind of scenario. It's not it's not that. It's just to t tell you that the uh, stock market is volatile and then six percent is it can happen anytime one. Just one week it can drop that much already. So please don't be surprised that you you see further downside now. And of course volatility could be down and could be up also right I also won't be surprised to say it just go up and then never never come down. But it's it just that chances are because of that line, like the 6% line is so near, right? So high chance it, it, will, it will touch that point. Uh. Even though after it touched that point, it could rebound and go up further, right? Uh, that, that could happen. But very hard to guarantee that the recent low, that line, it won't touch that and it just keep on going up. So I'm just trying to paint a picture from probability perspective and tell you that uh, it's unlikely. Uh. So that's point number one. Uh, second point is the point that I mentioned, I think since January, right, when the Fed minutes came out, I, I already said that, okay, likely to see more downside because now we don't have the power puts anymore, right? So they're going to r raise interest rate. I don't think they will do 50 basis point in March. I believe it is going to be 25 basis point. Um, but 50 basis point, if, if we look at the current uh, probability, right, it's also around, let's say, 15 or, or sometimes it spike up to around 20%. So it could happen also, 50 basis point. So whenever the interest rate is on the rising interest rate environment, right, um, the bond investment become more attractive and it's just uh, make the stock market harder to continue to to continue to keep on moving up uh. so in, in in other words right the corporate profitability needs to be a lot higher for the stock market to continue to generate more all-time high it's not like let's say last year or two years back right because two years back there's so much pessim pessimism built into the stock prices already as long as the numbers looks okay the stock market will go up. And then last year, it's still true because there's still plenty of liquidity and we still don't know when the liquidity will end. So also easier for market to create all-time high. This year is opposite already. The liquidity, although as of now, is still high, but it's expected to go down, right? So uh, due interest, interest rate will go up. So the corporate profitability need to be a lot higher la. If they, they are doing okay, right, um, then I, I believe they will just crap along the way. But if they are projecting some, some sort of slowdown, like Facebook, right, you see 20% down, this is normal because uh, like short seller will, will, be, will be happy to short the stocks, uh, knowing that they won't get screwed by the, by the Fed, you know. So, so that, that's my view with regards to like why, why I'm thinking that market has not bottomed. I um, hope that I'm clear on that. Anyone else want to comment on this? All right. Uh, what's your thought on buying Bitcoin and Ethereum for long term? Let me scroll around, see why CX around. Why CX is not here? I'll go first. Um, I have small position. Uh, still building position on Bitcoin more than Ethereum. Ethereum, I, I also have very small positions. Uh. For for me, uh, this is like a hedge. Uh. Let, let, let me just share some, some story, like some, some research that I've done. Uh, I think right now, US debt is around 30 trillions. And I think I shared before, right? Uh, US debt will, dub, will double every 10 years. So 30, as of now, 2030, they will become like 60 trillion. 
and then you become 120, 240, 480, and they will hit one quadrillion. Let's say within our lifetime now. Uh, so you, you may imagine the kind of the size of the monetary base it will increase. That that's uh, number one. Uh. Then number two is that why all this like Bitcoin is you you can see as a currency or store of value, right? And the main selling point is uh, there are two. One one is that they are scarce in nature. Um, it's not going to increase anymore. And then uh, second point is that the network effect, right? because people will put money uh, in an instrument that other also trust that as a good store of value. So Bitcoin prices has increasing quite quite a huge margin in the past ten years, right? So there, there, there will be some uh, network effect that's going on already. So you just pair the first statement with regards to the monetary base expansion with the second uh, statement, which is that you have something that is not going to go away because uh, how Bitcoin run is that the price can collapse, but the entire infrastructure behind Bitcoin will, will keep running. Even if you have war, even if you have all sorts of scenarios, right? Bitcoin will still be around. You just pair these two, you can come up with a, with a very strong bull thesis that the price will tend to go up in the future. Uh, talking about like, let's say decades ahead. Uh. So whether you want to believe this as a, a as a story, it's really up to you. Uh. So I personally believe the, the bull thesis, but it's not something that I want to put in like huge uh, amount of my own assets there. Uh. So that's why I said uh, I have some position and then I'm building uh, like very like DCA, just a small amount every month. Uh. So, so that's how I, my view on Bitcoin. Ethereum is a bit tough because I think that there's a lot of more stuff that you need to pay attention to. For example, like how the ETH 2.0 uh, is going to uh, proceed, right? And then they also have, in terms of functionality, Ethereum is much better than Bitcoin. They can do smart contract. They have a huge base of developers. Those are all true. But they also have like other um, cryptocurrency that is trying to replace or take on uh, Ethereum rules, uh, rules, right? For example, like all those Cardano, Solana, you might want to pay a lot more attention to and see whether uh, like Ethereum will be leading. Uh. So there will be more homework if you go into Ethereum instead of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a lot easier to understand um, from monetary perspective. Uh. Um, and then of course, if you go into other coins other than these two, right? Then the amount of research, uh, you need to basically like triple or quadruple your, the amount of research uh, to, to justify why you are not buying these two and the others because the risk is just a lot higher, right? So uh, the other, I, I, I don't spend much time to research on. Anyone else want to share your view on, on these two? Uh, actually, yeah, I want to ask a side question. Huh? For those crypto experts out there, why did Salvador choose to use BTC instead of other uh, cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I think for El Salvador, it's very interesting, right? Because, you know, if you say one day US, China, um, these countries will adopt Bitcoin, right? It's not going to happen because all these countries, they have their own currency, they have their own monetary system, they the country themselves, they control the monetary, right? So this is a huge power of whoever in charge. Right? So they are not going to sit out this control. But for El Salvador, it's very interesting because they, they don't even have their own currency. Basically, they are using US dollar. And if you are El Salvador, right, whether you are using um, USD or you now open up uh, to, to legalize the Bitcoin, it's like, I mean, it's a natural thing, right? You offer more options, right? So, so I, I think it's very natural for them to offer Bitcoin, uh, just because they don't have their own uh, currency at the first place, right? So, so this is first point, and second point is that you know, Bitcoin itself, right? You know, they move into Bitcoin is already very hectic when it comes to like taxation, uh, when it comes to the technology on how to uh pull up all these executions adoption. There's a lot of things already. Even now, after they they legalize um. Uh, make it become a, a, a currency, right? That now you see IMF come up with statement that say this may stabilize the country. 
destabilize their country and so on. So you see there's so much problem or challenges by just moving to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is already like the simplest um, cryptocurrency, right? So imagine if they move into others, right? It, I mean, the the complexity or the challenges will just multiply, right? So I, I in my opinion, they just want to go one step uh, at a time, just pull up Bitcoin first. If if they can sort out all the challenges, right? I mean, it's a lot easier to move into others. Just like if one person, right, they never invested in cryptocurrency, they just say, okay, now I invested in Bitcoin. Once you understand Bitcoin, it's a lot easier for you to like venture out to, to study other uh, cryptocurrency because you started from something that is the most basic one, right? So at least that, that's my, my take on uh, like why they don't go straight up to the others. Now. So, the, so that's uh, the, the complexity part. And the second part, right, um, I think if you follow the the prime, no, prime the president right he is not just like some someone who who is bullish on cryptocurrency uh, he is considered the bitcoin maximalist la, a bit like ycx la. so this group of people right they really bullish on bitcoin and bitcoin alone alone they don't they don't bull, bullish on other uh, crypto uh, for various reasons, uh. so I think this one I might need to invite crypto. Uh, we need to invite YCS for uh, like the detailed explanations. Uh. yeah. So that is my take. Uh, okay. Anyone else want to give your comment on, on the question just now? Okay. Uh, you want to say something? Okay, if no, uh, let's move on. Uh, better to buy crypto, NFT, or growth stocks to 10x. <laughs> um, anyone else want to comment on this? I, I actually don't have a comment. Eh. I think I think these three, all three can 10x. Eh. The problem is not um, comparing like crypto as a group, NFT as a group, or the growth stock as a group, you know. Uh, the challenges part is that, you know, within crypto, I can assure you, right, let's say over the next one or two years, right, there will be a number of crypto that 10x or even more. I can assure you out of thousands of crypto, there will be some that will achieve more than 10x. Among NFT, also the same. Among, among growth stocks, also the same. The, the, the difficult part is not to choose one of these three group. You know, The difficulty is at choosing the right one within the group. Like which crypto, right, out of like few thousand, which one will you put money in that can go up like 10x or 100x? That is the difficult part. You know, so so I can say that these three, they are all okay if you want to 10x. But to aim the right one to buy, uh, I would just say good luck. <laughs> it's very tough. <laughs> okay, that's my take. 10x which direction? Down or up? Uh, <laughs> uh, 10x down is a lot easier. La. <laughs> Uh, easier to strike uh, like like NFT right I, I, I can say I just blindly choose one right then let's say I bought it one at one uh, one ETH and then it will just drop like become 0 0.9 ETH 0 0.8 ETH 0 0.7 ETH over the next one year I think it's easier <laughs> up, up it will be harder and there's a lot of uh, su survivor bias right because let's say oh, after one year then you will see people writing blog like okay my <laughs> My net worth has increased by 2 million because I put 10k in this uh, shitcoin just goes up by like 50x, right? So this kind of story will come up. Uh. Then those who bought into crypto or NFT that go down in value, they're just quiet about it. Uh. So just bear in mind with the survival bias. Uh. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, is X-Men here or not? You are here, right? Just how you, you comment, right? So let me read out the questions first. Would you rather have 3 million USD, but your level of financial knowledge is the same as an 18-year-old and cannot grow? Or have 1 million USD with all you know now? Let's go around the table. Bunsung first. What's your preference? 
sorry, uh, washing clothes now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the question is from uh, X-Men, like 3 million US dollar, but the knowledge is stuck at 18 years old or, or 1 million US dollar. Which one would you prefer? Or, or X-Men, you want to comment on why, why you asked yeah. this question? Yeah, I, I would choose 3. I, I wow. believe that the, the distance is at least 12 to 13 years and there's no guarantee that you can turn the one into three or the one into zero. Also depends on the horizon, right? Say for example, someone ask, uh, answering this question, let's say, let's say it is 30 years old and let's say it's going to invest for another 30 to 50 years, right? So you basically want to triple your money. You want to generate an alpha of 3x over, let's say 30 to 50 years. That's work out to be like additional, let's say, maybe just one or two percent kind of alpha right you know uh, you spread out yeah. you spread out yeah if we can get one or two percent that's way that's a long that's a long horizon man i i think the three million is actually way more than the one <laughs> okay i why are why are you asking like just just is is there any more details? No, it's just curiosity. Ah. How confident people are to how valuable is the knowledge that we currently have? Is it yep. worth is the the extra let's say three percent the extra three percent worth it? Let's say you are. I mean, most of us are in the thirties. I I believe. Um, some of us in the forties, thirties to forties. I think some in the late twenties or so lah. So our horizon is around twenty years. I think so lah. So I I just feel that the 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 extra two million, the extra two two times the two million is worth more lah. I mean it's not as if you're eighteen years old you also don't want to do with money lah. You you pretend you're away, but you at least buy some property. Maybe you buy. Something that get, maybe maybe you have an insurance friend that tells you to buy a fixed income product that will generate two percent. Uh, these are things that can occur, lah. Whereas if you invest, you're getting seven percent. So uh, that and that's risk risk associated with, it, right? Yeah. Uh I think that, that's true. I, when I think about this question, I, I took some time to think about it actually. Uh, and, and here's my answer, right? So if uh, I reframe it slightly, for example, um, let's say I want to benchmark against myself who is investing 3 million into S&P 500. Uh, like, like just as if like as of, 13, uh, as of 18 years old, I already know that I'm going to be stuck at investing. I'm not going to increase my knowledge. But uh, I would just put my money into S&P 500, uh, 3 millions, right? That, that's uh, the, the benchmark. And I now having 1 million with all the knowledge that I accumulated from 18 years onwards, right? And then I need to beat that 3 million, right? I will say I would rather have 3 million and invest in S&P 500 because it's really, really hard to have uh, the alpha that can beat the uh, S&P 500 even let's say we're talking about 20 years uh, horizon, like like long horizon. I don't think it is that easy. That's why I would choose the 3 million. But I don't remember how much, uh, let's say, like wisdom I have, right, as of 18 years old. Because bear in mind that as of the 18 years old, right, haven't started working, haven't seriously uh, investing, um, like, like, I mean, not much wisdom. In terms of knowledge, there are some already. Like, at least we know how to do calculations. We know how to calculate the returns and so on, right? We know the concept of, uh, let's say, price over earning multiple. This kind of basic thing we know, but we don't have the wisdom. So if we don't have the wisdom, right, if I factor in someone with 18 years old and 3 million, without the wisdom to say, uh, I will just invest in uh, S&P 500, right? And, and I just think that, okay, I don't have that wisdom. Hence, I thought that I'm that great, right? I will take that 3 million and do fancy stuff. I might, uh, you know, I, I might end up with doing options trading, day trading, these kind of things, right? Because not lack of knowledge, but lack of the wisdom, right? Then that 3 million my end out become like losing half of it, you know? So uh, from that angle, I would say that, okay, then 
one millionth with the knowledge and wisdom that I have now is probably better. So, so it really depends on like the, the, how, how we frame the, the benchmark, the, the 3 million benchmark. I hope I answer, answer your questions, uh, Yusman. So I understand that different people would have different stages of life at 18. I mean, if you're at stage of life at 18, you know about S&P 500, then it's a no-brainer. But I think most people didn't know. Lah. Most people yeah, yeah. at the very moment, buy property, they rent it out, or buy some savings plan. I don't know. Lah. That, that's, that's why I probably think 18-year-old people know. Lah. Yes, because you... If you're three millions and then uh, you thought that that's a good amount and can last you very long time, right? And if you just w make one mistake, right? And that one mistake costs you fifty percent, uh, you are like one point five million gone, right? So all, all the knowledge and all the all the wisdom you accumulated over the years, sometimes it's not about like beating the the market, you know. Sometimes it's like helping you to uh, stay rich, you know. So, so that, that's the, the point that I want to bring up. Yeah, Bunso, you want to say something? This question actually sounds exactly like the time of value of money question in those CFA more exams. <laughs> but if you really go and work out the calculator the formula, right? Kega formula, uh, 3 million to 1. Uh, basically, if your timeline is 20 years and you're going to grow 1 million USD to 3 million, in a matter of 20 years, right, the kind of compound annual growth rate that you're expected to have in your investment is about 5.6%. So it's not too difficult if you were very prudent and put your money in the right next funds. Yeah, the point that I'm trying to say is that it is very hard to generate that additional 5.6% uh, above S&P 500, but it is a, a lot easier to lose more than 5.6% annually uh, if you're doing stupid thing, <laughs> you know? So, so it's better how stupid you are at <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's not about how smart are you with, your, with the knowledge that you have, but how stupid can you be without the knowledge? <laughs> Uh, 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 5.6%, I think it's not, it's not a terrible ask, 5.6%. So if you were to lose money for one or two years, then probably most people will give up and then start doing indexing. Uh, if you are 18 years old, after 38 years old, after you are reached 20 years at 38 years old, probably you, you will hit that 3 million. So I think both are equal, equal or 1 million at, uh, at present moment and 3 million at 18 years old. 50, 50, yeah. No difference to me. Yeah, true. Anyone else want to share your viewpoint? I see uh, Maximus is here, Hayden, Corey, Chiang. You want to share? Or Xiaoboy? I think this is a very interesting question, but no one wants to share. Kel I think Kelvin, I you want to share? The, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll just pick the 3M. It's easy, la, because if you pick the 3M, right, then you just put in Robo, I think it will just do fine. La. I mean, because the gap is like 1M to 3M is like it's quite huge. La. So if it's like 1M and 1.5M, I think then maybe you'll go with the 1M. But if it's 1M and 3M, then you just go for 3M. Yep. Yeah, yeah and also, it's always better to compound your investment earlier, right, and in a larger amount. So it's not actually whether you are smart or not, it's actually how, how patient you are and how uh, widely exposed you are. So, and you talk about S&P, right? You say that S&P is a sure, sure win, but it's also quite hard to say. Lah. Yeah, because if you look at Shiller, the, the Shiller PE is about close to 40 times, right? In this three has, has S&P performed extremely well in, in a 10-year period when it's at around 30 to 40 region. It's very hard to say. The, 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 the last time it's at 40 was, was around, uh, was, was, was during what, 1999? That was during the, the big crash, is it? I, I, I can't remember. 
Yeah, I, I think it's not like saying S&P 500 is sure win. It's about, because this is, like with just now I say this is the benchmark, right? Someone put 3 million at S&P 500 and I have 1 million. I need to beat this S&P 500 investor at 3 million. So I need to do better than S&P 500, you know. But how can I do better than S&P 500, right? It's a uh, relative things. Because if you say PE, uh, CAP ratio is high, S&P 500 is going to crash, right? Then how sure am I? investing at 1 million can beat the S&P 500 where S&P 500 is already the market that's going down, right? So you, you need to, unless you are very bullish on some other things, uh, for example, if you say you are bullish on, let's say, uh, uh, other market, uh, market other than US, right? I think they are all correlated anyway. So if S&P 500 crash 50%, other market will likely also crash. But if you are very bullish on other asset class, for example, you say you are very bullish on gold. You say gold is the is the true assets that you want to invest in, right? And you say, okay, uh, someone putting 3 million in S&P 500, I think S&P 500 will going to crash, right? And I put my money in gold and gold is going to be cheaper. Then of course, uh, with that kind of view, you will say, then I'd rather have my 1 million to put in other asset class, right? So, so I just want to, it's different topics, you know. The the one that I'm trying to say is the the alpha, the outperformance against the S and P five hundred. It's not saying that the S and P five hundred will sure make money. D different things. Yeah, got you. But it, come back to the uh, cap ratio. I also uh yeah yesterday there's some discussion with my friend another group. We also discussed right, why uh it makes sense or it doesn't make sense at current valuation, right? Yeah, I, I just want to share my, my view. Maybe maybe later I'll share I'll, I'll forward my message. Uh, I think uh, two viewpoint on why CAPE, slightly higher CAPE, it makes sense now. Number one is that um, there are more technology companies on S&P 500, especially the big tech. Uh, for example, all these companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and they are reinvesting a lot of their money. So say, for example, Amazon, right? You don't see much earning because they, they keep on reinvest. And with more companies like this in the index, right, you will always suppress the earnings and hence the price looks more expensive. But it doesn't mean that the, the companies has no value because they are not showing the earnings, right? Because uh, in terms of cash flow, they are still quite healthy, right? But you don't see that cash flow flow to the shareholder because they always flow back to the business. So this is uh, first point. And the second point is always the, the TINA argument, uh, uh, the TINA, uh, there is no alternative argument. Uh, this is to bring out that the bond yield is still very, very low. And hence, uh, there's not much incentive for money to flow to bonds. So they will just stay invested in stock market, right? So of course it's elevated. But let's say we are going to see more tightening uh, in the next few years. Let's say 10 year rate just shoot up to 4% and just stay like above 4% for some time, right? Then. I think there will be sizable or significant numbers of investors who are just happy with 4%, right? For those who, who make their monies, uh, let's say they have a couple of millions, right? Do you, do you want to take so much risk uh, in stock market or you are happy with 4 to 5% investor in fixed income, right? So if these investors are happy to park their, their money in bonds, right? Getting that uh, so-called uh, a safe returns, right? Then there's less incentive to, to stay in stock market and, and it's likely that stock market uh, will, will become weaker. Lah. So the TINA argument is true as of now. It might not be true moving forward. So this one is a bit like what was your outlook when it comes to interest rate. So if, if you think the interest rate uh, because of the demographic demographic and so on, right, it's going to stay low. And then I always take that as an argument that the stock market, although it seems elevated, but it makes sense. But if you believe that the interest rate will co continue to go up, right, then I will say that, okay, then I agree the cap is high, stock market is high. Bond market will, will revert to a more sensible pricing and same goes for the uh, stock market as well. Yeah, so so we are, we are on cap just now, just just want to voice my opinion. So later I'll, I'll just share that, that uh, message. Okay, come back to this 3 million versus 1 million. Anyone else want to share your view? If not, we move on. All right, Facebook 200, then buy. I think we have touched on this quite a f like uh, in, at the beginning of today's session. Um, yeah, 
I, I still want to reiterate the same now. Uh, don't buy because the price has dropped 20 plus percent. Um, like cheaper compared to one month ago is never a good buy thesis <laughs> because if it drop, it may continue to drop also, right? So you want to have a stronger uh, reason to buy. For example, you want to be bullish on the management. You want to be bullish on in terms of their strategy to pivot into metaverse. You want to be bullish in terms of how they how their strategy in keeping their daily active user. This kind of bullish uh, thesis uh, make more sense than oh yeah, it is cheaper by twenty percent, so I buy. So so don't, don't simply blindly buy the dip, you know. Um, yeah. And then you also want to take a look at their cash flow and see whether it makes sense or not. Do a simple DCF to see whether it makes sense or not. These kind of things uh, make more sense. Huh? And then uh, another point is that if you are buying, right, um, or you are holding, I think you also need to have some, please be aware that you are betting that the DAU at least not going to drop huh? At least they have to sustain. Uh, that is the implicit uh, bet that you are making. Because I can assure you, if they're going to see another drop in the DAU, they just need a small drop, you know, like a small drop, uh, like the drop from Q3 to Q4, right? It's just a very small drop. If you just see another small drop from uh, Q4 to the latest uh, next quarter Q1, right? I can assure you that the, the show you that the, the share price would drop uh, quite significantly. Yeah. So so that's my take. Uh. Other views? If not, we move on. Okay, next one. Growth potential of C Limited. I'm looking around. Anyone want to share your view? Kelvin, why? <laughs> you want to share? Or, or is Maverick here? I'm looking around because I want to look for those who are bullish on C Limited. Uh, so anyone else invested in this company want to share your view? Uh, let me find, see, I can get anyone who is who can talk extensively on C limited. So I think there are there are many others, right? Who, who is bullish? Um, yeah, I think I shared my view. I, I'm going to skip this round. No, no, no much additional view. Or let's wait for the earnings come up. Then maybe we can discuss more. Okay. Uh, what are your views of Alphabet stock split? Does it help to bring in more investor? Okay, I think this question, I think, let, let me uh, explain a bit. Uh. With regards to stock split, right, um, theoretically speaking, there's no change. Very simple, right? Like you have a cake, you just cut more pieces, right? I mean, the size of the cake will still be the same. So, I mean, economically speaking, there's no change at all uh, just because of the stock split. Uh. So, don't don't buy because of a uh, stock split. Uh, I would say, so that that's statement number one. Statement number two is that does it help to bring in more investor? You know, the price is like let's say close to three thousand, right? So become one hundred fifty. Definitely for those investor that uh, have no access to uh, fractional shares, right? It's a lot easier for them to buy. Um, so that's actually increase the liquidity or, or increase the volume trading. And all, all this, I think it will help a bit. Uh. Um, but coming from a long-term investing perspective, I would say this kind of change, right, in terms of liquidity, um, usually they are very short-term. Uh. You can just take a look at, let's say, Apple and NVIDIA or Tesla, which split in the past, right, or in recent past, right? Of course, within that, let's say, a couple of months period, you will see that, okay, if if there's momentum and momentum fit on momentum, it could go up, right? It could happen. But usually, just increase of liquidity is not going to be like a sustainable kind of increase over like long period of time, right? So it doesn't make sense to bet on that, uh, 
just just because of a split. Uh, the effect is usually quite short term now. So so don't don't bet on that discounting just because of the twenty to one. The the reason I bought uh right after they announced the stock split is not just because of the stock split, right? It's also because the earnings, um there's a lot of traction in, in their numbers, in their growth, right? So for for me it's just like uh just increase my, my exposure because I also underweighted my allocation to Google. Other than Amazon, of course. So, so I just want to increase that. Uh, look at their their traction. It's not because of the stock split. Uh. Just want to clarify that. Anyone else want to give your comment on this? If not, we move on. Uh, shorters are very cancerous. Hope their accounts blows up and die. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is quite funny. Uh, I don't know who are you referring to. Uh, yeah, I think, okay, let, let's be be fair on this. Uh, I think there are different short sellers, right? You know, there are people who do a little bit of short selling just because they, they want to hedge their positions, right? Say, for example, they they still bullish on their growth stocks, but they, are, they want to be neutral on the entire uh, group of growth stocks, right? So sometimes they might just long uh, the companies that they like and then they short uh, KT Wood stocks, right? They short ARCs. So I think this one is just like portfolio management kind of short. This is one one type of short sellers. The other type of short sellers is those that they, they just, okay, um, they short the stocks and then they come up with reports and then they spread some uh, fun, right? So I think this is different types, right? Because they basically just want to see companies that is, uh, they, they want to see them die. So uh, this is another group. And then um, there are also another type of short sellers that just like very negative kind. Uh. So, so I think there are all different types of short sellers. Don't, don't just put all of them into one group. So it could be just, you know, portfolio management, you know? So, so it, not necessarily cancerous, uh, that, that's what I'm trying to say. And usually, right, if you do long-term investing, right, you can just buy and then you can just sleep, right? I think that's no problem. But for, for those who do short selling, right, I think they are, they are usually very uh, careful with the risk management. Uh. So if you hope that their accounts will blow up and die, I mean, only those noobs will, will die. Uh. I think good short sellers, right, uh, they, they will hit your position one. So, so also very hard to die. Now. <laughs> I don't know. You want to, I, I, I don't know who posted this comment. You want to give your, your, your view or anyone else? Yeah, maybe I think, I, think, I, think, I think I think has more risk. Uh. Mm, because if you talk about CFD shots, you need to pay interest every day, right? And also 70% of the time, US market is either flat or, or, or going up, right? So actually, you're betting against the market. Lah. And then the the loss is unlimited. Lah. And also, if the if the counter go past, lah, uh, your, I think your money is, is also gone, right? If I'm not wrong. Yeah, very dangerous. Yeah, I think okay. the other thing about uh, short sellers, right, the, the positive side is they try to correct the market. So um, in cases like, for example, a GameStop, a AMC, where they are very far from fundamentals, right, that, that is what the short seller is trying to uh, make the so-called market, right? That's this type of short sellers. So, so and this take conviction when you are, are betting against so-called the, the mess uh, or the the hype that uh, you're trying to correct. And I think there, there are other short sellers that give warnings to uh, investors like Muddy Water um, when they posted certain um, counters where they do quite in-depth research to highlight that there's possible fraud. And um, they, are, they, they, they um, back their, act, um, their words with the action that uh, they put in their money as well uh, to tell the market that this is uh, their view and uh, what they are doing uh, to try to make it uh, right. So I think we need to differentiate the, the different, like what uh, uh, Kunti has highlighted, uh, the different categories of short, short sellers. Thanks, Maximus, for the comment. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely true. Um, and, and let's say if you 
buy certain stocks and then your companies are being shorted, right? <clears throat> as long as you are not over leveraged and you are still buying the companies, you should be thankful of these uh, short sellers, you know? So uh, they, they help you to push the price down, right? So it's good for you to accumulate if you are bullish, right? So I, I still recall, you know, the period where Tesla is heavily shorted, right? Um, I, I personally was very skeptical on Tesla at that time. I didn't buy, but my friend is super happy with the situation where he just see like a 10x upside and sh he, he know for sure that all these short sellers uh, were, were wrong. And then he just happily accumulates stocks. And since then, his position, like like huge position in Tesla just go up by 10x, right? I mean, he, he the the price of Tesla went up by 10x, you know, of course, the fundamental has improved significantly over that uh, recent two years period. But you also need to be aware that the 10x kind of changes is also because of the short sellers covering their shots. Uh. They are the one that push the price higher, because they don't, they don't have a reason to stay short on Tesla already. So they have to close the position. And how you close the positions is by is by buying back the shares from the open market, right? So that, that's why uh, the upward pressure on the market in late 2020 and also in, in 2021, uh, right? So yeah, I, I'm perfectly happy, let's say, if the stocks that, that I like, right, is being shorted. So uh, I'm happy with that now. <laughs> so, so don't have to be uh, too hateful. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on. Oh, this is not a question. It's just to say thanks to Bunti and others who contribute to the discussion and sharing. Yeah, I think uh, I just, yeah, this is definitely not one person uh, effort, right? Because if you ask me one person just to go through all this talking solo, I cannot do it. I just want to <laughs> share with you all. It's very tough to have solo talk, you know. Um, but when we have friends around, like chit chat, and then share some, some, some uh, knowledge sharing, perspective sharing, all these things, right? It's definitely help, uh, help, help, help myself, and also whoever who is interested to to tune in. So um, I also want to express my gratitude to everyone who is sharing here. Thanks a lot. Let's move on. If you took a personal loan of twenty k from bank. Maybe not a lot for some. Were you all in Tesla now or DCA from now? If you are a strong Tesla believer. Uh, I think we have chat about Tesla uh, in details in a uh, in couple of weeks back, right? So how to say, I think 20K, it, it really depends on how much um, DCA that you are doing. Uh. So I think... I personally will suggest DCA la, if, if I'm the person who is, um, have this extra 20k. Not because I am not bullish. It's just because DCA from, um, emotional perspective is a lot easier. Because let's say Tesla price now is, let's say, 900, right? It could trade at 700 or 650, let's say, three years down, right? It could, right? So, um, like if you just one lump sum and then no money to invest, right? And watching the money that you deployed just drop by one third and you don't have money, that kind of feeling just not, doesn't feel good, you know? So I would rather like DCA. But let's say if I already have strong cash flow from somewhere else, right? And I know that I will have decent amount of cash flow to deploy, then I don't mind to do a bigger lump sum now. Um, my comment is not specific for Tesla, it's for general stock market. So, so I always want to have this, um, this flexibility or, or this ability to DCA. To, to me, stock market drop is fine as long as I'm buying. So if I don't have money to buy anymore, right? I might even just sell 10% uh, of my total portfolio and, and just park there to make sure that I can DCA when the stock market is down. So that, that's for me. It's, it's more on the emotional management rather than a best way to manage portfolio kind of view. Anyone else want to share? What was your, what's your opinion? Let's say if you are in this scenario. Um, I, I think I, I can share a little bit more. Um, the leverage, I think, depends on uh, what type of leverage, whether is it a uh, margin against margin or uh, like a, a, 
a fixed overdraft or you know against uh, equity home loan those type so if it's a, a margin then just be aware that when you leverage it can cut both sides uh. when when the margin call comes you have to liquidate your position and there's no coming back whereas uh, if it's a fixed um, uh, so-called repayment uh, basis then um, it just based on cash flow um, so the key is whether your rate of return uh, versus the the interest you borrow uh, makes sense. So if you're paying like 10%, then you need to beat the 10% uh, per annum, um, which can be challenging at times. Yeah, true. But 20K also not a huge amount, right? So I, I believe um, the scenario here is that this 20K may be just small percentage of the overall portfolio. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I think good questions. It's just that we need more details uh, <laughs> just, just to, to have more um, uh, meaningful discussion. Okay, I think that's enough for this one. Um, this is not a question, uh, just a comment from, from someone. <laughs> uh, if I'm young, I will take the 1 million to grow with SF, SPY, assume 10% at, at 4% withdrawal rate, I can retire now. If I'm 65 years old, I will have the 3 million now. Yeah, I think this one also uh, bring out the point of the horizon, right? If I'm 65 years old, for sure, I take the 3 million as well. <laughs> yeah, you, you, don't, you, you don't need much, you know. Uh, you take the 3 million, even if you don't invest at all, it just spread out, right? It's also a decent amount of money already. Yeah. So I think, th thanks for the comment. Um, next one, next one. How many believe S&P will do as well the next 10 years as the last 10 years? Wow. Hayden, who want to comment? <laughs> keep, keep, keep ratio. Oh, no comments, I very hard to say. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, past, I think past performance doesn't equate to future performance. Uh, we, must, we must know that. Uh, so, and, uh, Future performance is very, is very, is very. Is, is, I mean, the stock market in general is always very unexpected, lah. It's very hard to say, also. You know, mm, I think because the the, the last ten years S and P is the, the 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 biggest tailwind is the Federal Reserve, right? The low interest rates, the the QE. So uh, the next ten years. It's very hard to say, lah. It's very hard to say, but the thing is, I I don't think it will be as, as good as 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 the last ten years, lah. Mm, but in terms of performance vis a vis other markets, hard to say. I, I think I think S and P might 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 still continue continue to outperform, lah. Especially uh, Hong Kong index, you know, in general. I, I maybe you can you can ask other people. Not I'm not very sure because I don't have a crystal ball, also. Yeah. Anyone else want to share? I, I, I think it will depend on the interest rate hikes. Huh? Mm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Um, I think for my view, right, I, yeah, I agree with uh, what Hayden and A said just now. Uh, and we, we can go back, all right? Let's say past 10 years, that was what? Um, 2012, right? So 2012, right, I can share with you the, the economy was very, very bad. Huh? Um, we have 2009, that's when the global financial crisis hit. And then the problem is not like just within a single year, everything come up, right? So we actually it started with the subprime crisis. And then we see the real estate uh, market drop and then stock market drop. All this happened in 2009. And then from 2010 until 2012, actually uh, US market has been like, struggling uh, in terms of the economy so and then we have the european uh, sovereign crisis not sovereign european crisis right so uh, greece all these like they they, they are like really essentially they're they already bankrupt right there's a lot of negotiation just to help greece and then we talk about like all these you know the, the peaks countries portugal italy all these are in deep problem so i mean globally speaking right until 2012 is really bad and then from 2012 onwards right uh there's there's significant improvement as compared to 2009 to 2012 
So economy started to pick up. And then you can see that uh, the economy and also the corporate profitability doesn't all come out like even uniform basis. Actually, most of the gains, right, in S&P 500 is all come up from all the, the large uh, four or five big tech. So, and, and those big tech, right, it's not just um, the price multiple expansion. Um, actually, why they come up is two, two things, right? One is their corporate profitability, meaning that the revenue is going up a lot and then their profits going up even more because of the operating leverage, right? So you, you can just uh, read some old, story, uh, old news, right? Like, for example, Apple was trading at very low uh, price multiple um, and then iPhones, uh, those periods are still early, right? Uh, and people are not even sure that uh, Apple iPhones is able to compete with Android and so on. But all this become history already. And now you can see that their, their earnings are all very strong. Revenue also growing very strongly. Basically, um, they enjoy both from revenue growth, earnings growth, and price multiple expansion. And the general economy is also doing well. So all this happened in the past 10 years. So in order for the next 10 years to do as well, right, it's actually very, very tough because, uh, you know, you need to have a lot of all this pessimism built into the stock price and then and then you outperform that, then only you have that kind of returns, right? So so I, I do believe that over the next 10 years, uh, the return won't be as good as past 10 years. And somehow with all this uh, QE uh, interest rate also, uh, it's going to reverse soon, right? So I think these two arguments is enough to tell you that it's unlikely to see a return that is better. So so that, that's my comment, uh, like comparing past and future. But I also want to say that actually you don't need like past 10 years kind of return to have a decent return, you know? Like even if over the next 10 years, let's say if it grows at, seven percent right seven percent is low, definitely lower than past 10 years i believe past 10 years is like something that's like more than 10 percent for s p 500 right so let's say if you just grow at seven percent you still double your money you know the rule of 72 take 72 divided by seven percent right you you double your money in 10 years so let's say if your portfolio is let's say 100k now right uh s p 500 doing okay -ish, less than past 10 years, but you double your money. So is it important that it is it, it will do as well as past, past 10 years? It's not, right? You, you just need to stay invested and you will have a, a decent outcome, right? Yeah. So uh, I would say uh, even with all the the pessimistic statement that I just made, right? Like like don't, don't, don't expect it go up as much, right? Uh, but stay invested is still the way to go, right? If you are pessimistic, uh, I hope that that is uh, make it a very tactical kind of view. Uh. So, so um, you you can say um, I'm pessimistic because of the interest rate up. I just want to de-risk a little bit. Uh, tactical movement. Whenever the stock uh, market corrected, right, you see a good entering, right, then you better just enter and stay invested, right. So I think that that should be the way, uh, Because you know sometimes this feeling or this kind of view. Like you, you feel that, wow, uh, stock, uh, interest rate go up, market will correct. This kind of view, it will fit on itself, you know. Once you stay pessimistic and you see market drop, right, you become more confident on your pessimistic view. Then markets can go up irrationally and you say, ah, it will come back down. And then sometimes just because of that, it will just keep going up and, and you miss the train already. And it's a lot harder to buy it back when when it goes up above your, above the price that you sold at, you know? So, so you need to be, just remind yourself that even you can be uh, pessimistic over the short term, but don't make it become your long-term view because very, very hard to bet against the market over the long-term basis. Though. So, so um, yeah, that's, that's my view. I Anyone else? Well, yeah, okay. I think uh, Prudent has some exposure to uh, Hang Seng Index, Tracker Fund, because now their PE is, almost single digit, right? And then you look at their components, it's not all tech like S&P, the top five, it, it's HSBC, that we wish it has some kind of a tailwind due to the interest rate high, right? They are based on LIBOR. So if the interest rates keep going up, their NIM will also go up. So HSBC and you know, Tencent, Alibaba, all these annualized predicted, I think 20 to 30% growth annually is quite, it's quite reasonable, right? So 
And also, Hong Kong stocks in general, there's no tax on dividends. So you, the the tracker fund gives you a higher yield because it, the earnings are passed pass through the shareholders more transparently like, than S&P, which is 30% tax. Uh. So I think potentially, if you talk about 10 years, I think Hang Seng might, might outperform S&P. You, know? you never know also. Yeah, yeah. I think all these move in cycles. One, uh. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see other markets do better than than S&P, uh. especially like you say, right, um, Hang, uh, Hang Seng Index, they come with a uh, larger uh, bank exposure, right? That like Even just SDI outperform, um, let's say from now until next one to two years, I also think that that's quite normal because they, because they have more uh, financial sectors, right? Yeah. Okay, um, this is, I think, comment. For Tesla, I will still do DCA as I see Tesla also can go down fast and I won't want to get caught stuck in one stock and have more chance to catch other drop. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I do agree. Uh, DCA, DCA is good stuff. <laughs> okay, um, next one. Anyone still positive on China tech stocks uh, in US stock market? I think this is referring to companies like Alibaba, NetEase, what else? Uh? Baidu, Baidu also uh, listed, right? Pinduoduo also. So all these um, Chinese stocks that is listed on US stock market. I think whoever who still invested are bullish uh, because, you know, the drop in, let's say, Alibaba, all this is um, mostly because of the sentiment, right? Uh... Yeah, those who invested, I'm, no, I'm sure that they are still bullish. Uh. And actually not much has changed, right, in the past one, one month or so. So I think their movement it still depends on how China economy is doing and also um, like what type of new regulation that will come out, right? I think these are need to pay attention to. Or... Uh, Hey, then you want to comment uh, any development that you are following with regards to like China tech stocks? No, much. Yeah. Very hard to base it on macro. La. Basically, Alibaba, the reason why is because it's, it's, it's cheap in terms of some of parts. Uh, and then the mode is also quite wide due to the global infrastructure. They, I mean, they are, they are aiming for like 72 hours delivery globally, right? I mean, it's very hard to match their mode. La. So, um, hard to say, la. just just hold and see, la. you know. Yeah. Yeah, strong mode, definitely. And also now, with such pricing, such relation, um, there's margin of safety also, right? You, you don't have to bet like, wow, um, what, 30, 40% top line growth, that kind of uh, high growth rate, right? They just need to continue and you just need the uh, sentiment turn a bit less bearish <laughs> then it will be a good investment yeah the sentiments of baba now is i think it's, it's, I think it's <laughs> all, all time low, time low, which is a good time to invest now you know yeah yeah definitely what about jd jd and pink toto Research, but recently, the, the 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 founder donated to CCP again, right? Like charity again. Good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think there there will always be a China discount, yeah, because of the top top down effect I mentioned previously. Yeah. Mm, so it can never match the valuation of the US counterpart. There there will always be a, a China discount there. But the thing is. Is it is it too excessive? We have to uh, think for ourselves, you know. Yeah, I think it's fine as long as they generate free cash flow um, and do some buyback. Uh, I don't mind stay invested, you know. Uh, for for me, it's very small position on Alibaba, but I think as long as they are doing that right. Uh, if my company is doing share buyback, I would rather they do it at a cheaper price. Uh. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Say, for example, like um, Apple, right? They still generate uh, sizable free cash flow. Sometimes I'll just rather they, they just uh, 
like just put the money, just pay pay off the debt, and then uh, keep a bit, some cash in their balance sheet. I don't mind so much about the the cash drag or or like this inefficient use of cash. These kind of things, right? I rather that they just put into store it a little bit. So you know, like all this correction, it will come sooner or later, right? When that period come, then you can just use all this cash to do a massive uh, share buyback, right? I think this definitely makes sense. Uh. Because if you do a lot of share buyback at uh, market high, doesn't make sense uh, in, in my opinion. But now for Alibaba, I think with the current valuation, uh, they can, they can. I mean, share buyback is very cheap for them. Uh. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, we have close to the end of the session. I try to keep it within two hours, if not too long. Thanks a lot to everyone who joined the session and contribute to the discussion and questions. Um, see you all in, in next session. Okay. Back to the group chat. <laughs> I'll upload the, the video later. Okay. Thanks a lot. Enjoy your lunch. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.